Welcome to the Coffee and Poets podcast, where poets interview poets. This show is partially brought to you by the Sacramento Creative Economy Grant. We are recording live from the Brick House Gallery and Art Complex, located in historic Oak Park, 2837 36th Street in Sacramento, California. If you would like to listen to past episodes, you can go to our website, coffeeandpoets.com. I am your guest host and poet, Ronnie Bopla, and today we will be interviewing Lisa Dominguez Abram. Welcome to the audience member that are here in our live studio, as well as anyone who is listening out there. Welcome to Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, before we start this conversation, Lisa, I'd like to mention your biography. And it's a, you know, it's a very impressive biography because it also includes some of your, your current projects that you're working on in the community. Um, of course, your new book is Coyote Logic, recently released from Blue Oak Press, which is headed by Randy White. And we also have Joshua McKinney's hand in there, too, as one of the editors. And uh, I'd like to share that Lisa is the winner of the 2016 Swan Scythe Chapbook Contest for Matahari Blows a Kiss, and the Literary Awards, the Bazanella, and a Room of Her Own Award from California State University, Sacramento. Her first chapbook, Low Notes, was published by Red Wings Press in 2007, and we can revisit Red Wings sometime in our conversation. And her many poems have appeared as uh, published poems in Southern Review, Prairie Sooner, North American Re Review, Poetry East, The Cumberland Review, Thule Review, and Mobius, The Journal of Social Change. In spring of 2018, she was a featured writer in Susun Valley Review. As I had mentioned initially, she's also involved with a lot of community events, and some of those have to do with ekphrasis, I would say, um, and the organizations that are um, are really part of the work that she is doing, Sacramento Cen Center for Contemporary Art, the artists Ku Kwang Suk and Sandra Davis, and also a performance and writing piece, Respite, which has to do with Wayne Tebow's Floodwaters as part of the Crocker Art Museum exhibition, Wayne Tebow, The Homecoming. And then also interesting, I didn't know this, Lisa, that you have a poem that had to do with the works of Frank Ordaz, and that is currently on display in part of the Auburn California Central Square Art Park. So that's amazing. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to see it up there yet. Oh, wow, that's it. amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. going to be another phase of the artistic process, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to say, you yeah. know, it, it's hard to say what, it, what that will, how I'll react to seeing it in that form. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Well, um, please welcome Lisa, and uh, we are going to launch into some questions about her life, her writing, as well as her newest publication, and I'd like to start actually with some of those community projects. We're going to kind of start okay. with um, some of that information that I provided to the audience about the community work. And how did you become involved with some of those? So all of that has occurred through invitation. And I, I think as a writer, I think a lot of uh, artists are like this. I'm, I'm pretty, I guess, insular. I don't. You know, I, I, I do my life, and I'm not out in the community as much as I'd like. I've um, So it's been about all I can do to work a full-time job and take care of my family. Right. And um, I had shared with you earlier, I have a couple of you know, family members. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say the last 10 years or so, I have not been out there in the world. But fortunately, mm -hmm. I have connections with people who have not forgotten me, <laughs> of course, <laughs> and who and who have extended invitations to me to be part of these kind of um, interactive projects, mm -hmm. and so that's what happened. So the um, the body stories uh, that you had mentioned before, mm -hmm. that was simply I think it was a series of po poems that was a while ago, 
uh, where we read in an art space, and that was the art on the wall. So it wasn't so much interactive mm -hmm. as sort of um, kind of these parallel types of art pieces, whether written or visual or video or whatever, mm. about what it means to be a woman in a body. Interesting. And um, I was just fortunate enough to, to read there. And the thing with the Crocker Art Museum, I got invited. There were several poets that got assigned, I guess, for a, um, an exhibit they had there, a, a painting of T. Bose. Mm -hmm. And then we were asked to write mm -hmm. a poem in response to it. And the same thing for the Frank Ordaz piece that was through, um, I believe the Sacramento Metropolitan Arts Commission. Yes. They had a display out at the SMUD Center mm -hmm. and, um, and different writers were given the work of a particular painter mm -hmm. and asked to write a poem in response. And so they sent me three, uh, you know, images of three different pictures of yeah. uh, Frank Cordaz's and I chose one and then wrote a poem in response to it, which I found it's, it's a really different thing writing on demand mm -hmm. to a particular topic with a deadline. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, this ain't journalism. Right. You know, it's like, for me, <laughs> exactly. it's like, this, this is a whole different kind of thing. Or, right. You know, that, I, I think of be, doing that kind of work more for my work work. Mm -hmm. So, um, not that I'm a journalist, but it was, it was interesting. And so, yeah. I, have, I have conflicted feelings about what I have produced for those projects because I, I need more time away from them. Like mm -hmm. I've almost been afraid to go back and read what I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, I have, but yep. I, you know, just to see how I feel about it. Yep, I, I myself write poetry and, and, you know, we call it ekphrasis. And I think that having strong imagery in poetry, sometimes we're already doing that, but we may, we may not be conscious of it and then been given this type of assignment, yes, the time demand and what it entails, eventually it'll be on display or yeah. it's a different type of audience, you know, people you don't necessarily know where you might, you don't really intersect with. I think that's fascinating. And so when you wrote- I'll just say as a yeah. companion to that though, yeah. it's very inspiring to look at what somebody else has produced. It's an idea that would have never come out of your mind. Mm. And then to respond to that idea, that perspective, those colors, that energy, I think it, it does help us uh, as our, you know, in, in the general growth as writers to mm -hmm. do something like that because that was not something I would have come up with independently, you know? Yeah. So I think there's a real, I mean, it's been, it's really a blessing to be able to do that. That's wonderful. And it makes me think of how, and this is, you know, me expanding it to just general diversity where diversity actually has been akin to creativity. So when you have a diverse type of modality or genre, you're mixing genres, you are actually maybe doing the same thing as when you mix different types of people right. or you know, different environments. Or in the science world, we say they collide and then they intersect in certain parts. So bringing those two types of modalities, it, I can see how that opens up a huge opportunity. Yeah. yeah. I love being part of projects like that. That's exciting. It's so cool. Yeah. At work right now. So I teach it, or I, I work at Cosumnes River College. Um, you teach English at Cosumnes. Is that, how long have you been doing that? I do. I have been at CRC since 94. Lucky South Sacramento. Lucky South Sac. <laughs> Lucky South Sac. And as you know, I started at Valley High across yep. the street. So she I was my English teacher in high school. So <laughs> yeah. I'm just throwing that in there. <laughs> so I just walked across the street. Same exit all, the, all these years. Nice. Um, and um, our composer there, or one of the composers, Kurt Erickson, has written um, a, a series of pieces in response to the poet Brian Turner's book, Here Bullet. Mm. And so this coming week, and then o Omari Tao, who's a baritone voice, he, ha he has seen some of these pieces. And so this coming week, I, got to sit, I get to sit in on a workshop that they're giving for our campus community. And of course, I think anybody is invited to talk about that collaboration mm. between the two of them and Brian Turner. And what they've asked me to do is talk a little bit about the poems of Turner's that they chose to set to music and voice. Interesting. And so it's amazing to have my work life and my real life yeah. <laughs> intersect. Yeah. You know, it doesn't happen very yeah. often. 
Well, that's so, that's great. Yeah. I mean, I think that oh, and yeah, you're yeah, living you the dream for up. sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For that minute. Absolutely. Yeah. So. So let's go to your latest publication because okay. it's definitely a book and a collection to be celebrated. I've enjoyed reading it and I've known a little bit about the progress that was being made because I have a connection to the press. Yeah. Um, so um, tell us about it because I could probably make commentary on poems, but tell us about, let's say, what's the story of the name of the book? Oh, okay. Um, so I was listening to the radio and happened to hear a story about coyotes, the animal, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I really wanted to make that distinction mm -hmm. and how they, are, some of them are living in San Francisco right now and, mm -hmm. and they're starting to see them in more and more urban areas. And it just struck me how much, how, um, how resilient and uh, uh, and persistent and adaptable they are. Mm. And that made me think of people mm. and particularly um, women of color mm -hmm. who often are single parents mm. and find ways to do their jobs, work their lives and and raise their children, not simply provide for their children, but really raise them and train them to think. So, and it reminded me of, of the best of that kind of way of thinking about how to navigate the world. Mm -hmm. So that's where the mm -hmm. title came from. Mm -hmm. And yeah, mm -hmm. looking at the book, looking at the collection, I think one thing that was interesting for me, it was such a blessing to work with Randy and Josh on this, but because it is my first full length collection, you, I started seeing where, and, and it was difficult to put together for me because it's poems that probably span 20 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Coyote Logic, I think I wrote last summer, mm -hmm. that title poem, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, but some of the poems in there might be, or a few might be, I don't know, I made up the number 20. Don't, right, right. Don't, don't hold me to that. But they, but they, they, but they, they encompass a span of years. Mm -hmm. And so then you start seeing what kinds of concerns for you come up again and again. I find I write a lot about workers, mm. particularly workers that tend to be invisible. Right. And often as I'm looking at it, mm. particularly workers of color who tend to be invisible. Not a, a lot, but I just see that over the years I've had these poems. I didn't know that about myself. It's interesting <laughs> that you point that Before out. I put that yeah. <laughs> book yeah, I had picked several poems and they all have to do with those people who they work three jobs or they're not really concerned about the recession because they're living you know yeah. the, the possible recession I should say. They're living the best way they know how and I was this might be a good opportunity for us to hear a poem. Oh, sure. Um, I have several marked and one of the ones I thought would be applicable to our conversation would be let's say museum security and I'm you know if anyone has the book it's on page 18. Um, going on the lines of of how books are put together. I love also that a lot of your poems are in first person. A lot of them did stand out. This one not in particular, but when I read a first person poem, I become that person. I become that speaker, so I think that's powerful. So, in any case. Okay, um, museum security. Camouflaged in his navy blazer and dark skin, my cousin blends into the display of ancient Egypt and steps from shadow only to say, don't touch or no flash. In a glass box, a single cheek and pair of lips glisten, Nefertiti, fragments of her. He studies the broken edge of brown stone and her polished mouth as patrons wander by, eyes opaque with the freedom to take in Egypt and the Impressionists and a latte in one visit. 
They stroll past the queen's curved mouth, so perfect it sparks a man's thirst for a lost world. Mm. That's an amazing two last lines, a man's thirst for a lost world, and just really encapsulates mm -hmm. how we do thirst for the past. Um, what was the motivation behind this poem, or what do you remember? Was this one of the recent ones, or one, one of maybe? I, I'm not sure. Mid? Mid, We'll yeah. call it mid. Yeah. Um, so the, this is what has always struck me about museums. So the majority of the security guards are people of color, and the majority of the patrons are white. And the guards are always, uh, it seems like, I don't really know anything about the job, but it seems like they stand in one room for a while. And so it seems to me, and what's interesting too is because they usually are in sort of a, a darker color that tends to, I mean they do sort of, you don't see the patrons seeing the workers in the room usually. They're so, their eyes are drawn to what's in the, in the displays or what's on the wall. But it seems like if you're standing in that room for a long time, what you're seeing is the art. And then, especially for someone of color being in a room um, with art from, you know, a, a place that they might, for whatever reason, connect with, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, it would, it would, I could see a homesickness. I could see that kind of feeling of a homesickness of mm -hmm. the places where, I mean, for lack of a better word, I'll say, our art is celebrated and and yet this worker is invisible in this space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't know if yeah. maybe I talk it better than I write it. But that's what I was, that's, that was sort of what I was that was sort of the that was the feeling yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. I mean they're they're a living being in that space and everything else is inanimate. Um, and you have to wonder how, how, how that dynamic works. It's a really complex thought to kind of put together. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of controversy and a lot of um, new writings having to do with different sects of um, ethnicities and people of color that are not being represented in museums mm -hmm. um, at the administrative level or within the art themselves. Um, so I think I thought that that stood out. Thank you for reading those. Thank That's you amazing. For reading it. Are there any other poems that you'd like to read of your own choosing? Uh, your own or from Coyote Logic? Um, well, I guess it depends on where our conversation is going. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah. you know, this is a little bit more freestyle than okay. I imagined, yeah. but it's I, so I hope the, that it's... Um, yeah, no, that's totally fine. Is there anything else that you wonder about? Well, I, you know, the one poem that did stand out to me also was Home Remedy, oh, um, uh -huh. which goes along the lines of that kind of a, the person who is in our life but then sometimes is not invisible, but then they're, they're, they're significant. That's how I saw it. Um, but let's hear it. Let's hear that one. Okay. Well, this one's an older one. That's an older yeah, one. Yeah, this is an older one. Yeah? Yeah. So this was when I was, this is a poem where it's kind of trying to grapple with childhood and, mm. um, uh, you know, what, what does a good girl look like mm -hmm. or sound like for our traditional mothers? Mm. That's where this one came, <laughs> came from. Home Remedy. The wrinkled print of my mother's grip branded my arm when she pulled me, a toddler from boiling water I spilled as I tried to touch steam rising from the stove. Years later, she said I was still trouble, refusing dresses and barrettes. Normal girls whispered about boys. I yodeled to neighborhood dogs, leading my pack through vacant lots until the day my throat swelled with strep. So sore, I confessed and opened my mouth to my mom. She drove me to the rail yard, to a boxcar with wheels rusted fast 
and a trellis of bougainvillea. Inside, she whispered Spanish to an old woman who braced her palm against my forehead, angled a stick past my tongue to dab thick salt paste onto tonsils. Saliva trickled like broth through constriction, a treatment to cure strep, and perhaps rinse my voice to a gentler tone. They listened to me breathe, eyes narrow, waiting. The home remedies. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make us into good girls. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about, you mentioned it a little bit, I mean, even within that poem is a place of origin. Yes. Yeah. And uh, some of the influence that you've had, um, but more specific to you as a writer. I mean, of course, our general backgrounds, our parents, our people around us influence us, and those are sometimes topics of our writing. But who or what would you really think that has really marked the turning point for you as a writer? Without a doubt, my writing families. Mm. You know, my writing families. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm super lucky to be part of two. Um, and one of them you had mentioned, the Red Wing, Red Wing Press, but yeah. also this group that we call ourselves the Red Wings. The amazing Kathy French, who's here, uh, and everyone else in that group. I've just been so lucky to be with a group of writers or meet regularly with a group of writers we're meeting after this mm -hmm. to, um, to share ideas about books, to bring drafts, mm -hmm. to workshop poems, to not bullshit each other about those poems mm -hmm. and not just say, you know, good job, yeah, yeah. but to help each other stretch our crafts. Right. And so for me, I think it's, it's having those connections. And, that, and another group, less formalized, but also with Kathy and Denise Lichtig and Gary Short, who mm -hmm. are amazing writers who write so, so differently for me. And so that's what's kept me going. I, I think also a turning point for me, if we go take it a step back, was mm -hmm. the, the, um, the lucky break of studying poetry with Dennis Schmitz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And having Dennis as a, as a writer, um, I love his cold eye. Yeah. <laughs> and warm heart. Yeah. And he will always look for your intention. Mm. So he will never... He, I've never saw that man cut anybody down. I always saw him give people suggestions mm -hmm. that moved the piece, whatever it looked like forward, because he, he recognized the interior of people's intentions. That's beautiful, yeah. And, um, and plus, just very lucky that to study with such a really fine human being. Mm because most of us artists are not, are not particularly fine to <laughs> And to me, Dennis was a great model of being a maverick in his art and being a solid family person mm -hmm. devoted to his family. Like those two things coexist in him. It's, you know, I think some people, what, what is that saying, you know, that um, be bohemian uh, so most people want to, most art, a lot of artists want to be bohemian in their lives, sure. but then they're bourgeois in their art. Mm. It's and true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And I think for Dennis, it's the opposite. Oh, okay. You know, I probably bungled that, that quote, but that, yeah. So for me, those are the two lucky mm. things. Studying with Dennis Schmitz, having two really remarkable mm -hmm. uh, writing families. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's, he's definitely a stalwart in our community, mm -hmm. him being the first poet laureate along with Viola. Um, I would like to share something about him, though, that I haven't mentioned very much, but uh, I published a, a journal of erotica in 2004, and after I published it, whoever was the poet laureate, I would give them a copy. And of course, I gave one to Dennis. I sent it to him in the mail. Mm -hmm. And he sent me, I wish I kept that handwritten note, but it said something to the effect of, thank you for the book. 
This is not erotica, in my view. However, it has potential, which goes completely along with what you're saying, because he was being honest about his view of, you know. Uh -huh. um, and I think when I see him again, I'll give him another copy to see if he'll <laughs> read it a second time and see if he's changed his mind. But um, I, I took it really well, because I thought, this is what I need to know, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, it was neat to hear or read a comment about erotica from Dennis, because that's something a little bit out of maybe his lane. Um, <laughs> but yeah. um, I'm sure he's read his share of erotica, though, maybe. <laughs> so let's talk about a little bit more about your, your influences in particular. You mentioned the first group that you're part of, and you regularly meet, and you're planning to meet today. Uh -huh. Um, what tips can you give us as writers or emerging writers um, that you've gleaned from that group? Because it's a very strong group. I mean, there's a Zeppa in there. There's a yes. French in there. Yes, so um. Catherine French. Oh my gosh, you'll have to help me, Kathy, if I forget anybody. Victoria Dalkey. Yep. Carol Firth. Yep. Susan Kelly DeWitt. These are all yeah. wonderful writers. Wonderful yeah. writers. Kathleen Lynch. Um, Mary Zeppa, yeah, Kathy and me. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what can we take away from your experience living through that, just not being able to be part of that group, but something, maybe we want to start our own group. How's that? And how would we, um, what would be a valuable takeaway from your experience? Well, I like the way that we have, uh, I like the way that our gatherings are structured. Mm. So, the, so the very first thing I would say is, um, you know, and I think this is a delicate balance. You, every group, I think, every personality, you know, shifts a group a little bit. So you'd have to find your own way to edge away from bullshit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, I don't have a better way to say that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, because I think what happens with a lot of writing groups is that people want to support one another as human beings. Mm -hmm. And you can support one another as human beings, but still give genuine insights into craft. Mm -hmm. So, and I also like the way that our group is structured. So, um, somebody, it started, Kathleen Lynch started this. She mm -hmm. invited a group of us to her house. And um, she had chosen a book for us all to read. And so when we went there, we had read the book and everybody chose a poem that they wanted to talk about. That's usually how we start mm -hmm. is, each of us talking about a poem in the book and what we notice in it. Okay. So for me, it has taught me, not only it exposed me to more writers, but mm -hmm. it's also taught me how to read more deeply mm -hmm. than I might if I have my own observations. It's so interesting to hear what other people's observations are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we eat. Okay. Well, we've got to have, important. you know, just Actually, I guess I should sustenance. start with the very first thing. Yeah. So we get there. It's always at 1230 on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we open wine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then we talk about the books. Right, right. And eat. And then whoever had hosted the previous time also has given a prompt to the group. Mm. And so we've each written a draft to that prompt. So in addition to reading the entire book. The, the book, well. Well, I mean, it, attempt to, at least to the yes, best of their ability right. or time. And then they've written to a prompt All of us before you come a to prompt. the Oh, OK. Yes. So you know, like a good girl, I've got my draft in here my, in my bag you know, for, our, for today. So then, and then we go, we each bring, we bring copy for everyone else, and we go around the table, and each person reads their drafts and receives comments on it. Interesting. So we're all unified with the, I'm assuming that I'm there vicariously, uh -huh. I guess. And then we've written on the same prompt, but I'm sure the poems are so different. Vastly different. There's no so structural different. constraint. Like, it's not supposed to be prose. Well, or it's if not it's Carol Frith, then, then yes, there is, <laughs> there is structural constraint. She will, she she'll, will say, yeah, you know, this has she'll to be. She'll villain yeah. us or okay, something, villain, right? Okay. You know, of course, or make of us do a sonnet. But um, so, yeah. And they come out very differently. And I really feel like this is what has certainly kept me alive. Mm. Um, as a, as a writer and, as a, and as, as a person, you know, in so many ways. Yeah. So, so then, wonderful. and then somebody, theoretically, somebody else hosts the next time. That person will then choose the book, come up with the prompt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I, I think, think it's a great thing. It's, a, it's, it's worked out well. It's not a common format that is utilized because some of the more the workshops that we have in Sacramento, like the Sacramento Poetry Workshop on Tuesday night, follow the Amherst type of um, format where people bring their poems and then they, um, we don't have the same people come every time. So this is, this is a nice platform, I would say, where all of you are being elevated at the same time, I think. That's, that's wonderful. Well, Lisa, let's move on to uh, some other things that we haven't discussed yet, which, Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Well, you mentioned briefly your profession, and you've you've been in education for a long time. Uh, what would you like to share about it? I mean, what what is something about your profession or the evolution of your profession that has impacted your writing, or has it been something separate? It's been separate. Mm -hmm. So. Even yeah. though you teach in the English department, your your you is it your brain is like okay now I'm teaching and then now in a different time I'm how does that so for me um, because at a community college you mostly teach composition mm -hmm. and I, even though I've had usually each semester I've had a chance to either teach a literature class because I'm blessed to be full time either a literature class or a creative writing class um, for me you are always at least in, you are spending many, 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 many hours each week responding to other people's words and other people's thoughts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, it takes me a while at the end of a semester to begin to hear my own ideas mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. my own thoughts. Mm. I don't have a great multitasking brain. I, I don't I really know if that's don't. advantageous to I, begin with. Well, I think it would be far more advantageous for my writing if mm. I did. I mean, sometimes I'll carry little notes around with me. So I've, I've tried to kind of keep things going. But I find that during the semester, I am thinking about those students. I'm thinking about the, the lives that they're bringing into the classroom and that I mm. am responsible for interacting with You know, certain difficult parts of those lives. Yeah and trying to help those people and trying to be Dennis Schmitz with their writing yeah, yeah. and respond to their intention and also move them forward uh, so that they can be successful because you know composition is such a foundation skill mm -hmm. that I'm trying to give people the foundation to go on and do whatever they want to do. Right. I mean, so yeah. I just don't have, I mean, I, my brain just doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. And I think also because my home life has been there, or my, you know, my, my family life has been um, complicated and requiring a lot from me. It's not like I go home and then I chill. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, it takes me a while to start hearing my own ideas. Again. Right. Right. I can relate to that because my mom has Parkinson's. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and that's taken me out of some of the things that I really enjoy in terms of the poetry community. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't want to write about Parkinson's, yeah. you know, I mean, I can write about it for a bit, but then, you know, there's little, little enjoyment out of that topic, uh -huh. and I like the enjoyment aspect of writing it. Yeah, um, yeah so that balance. So the, um, you mentioned, you're very nurturing, I can tell. I mean, you really care about your students, and I'd like to remind everybody that <laughs> you were my English teacher in high school. Um, I think I remember one paper that I wrote, and it was on a really heavy topic of suicide, and you had made some significant remarks that I actually can remember what they were, and you were very sensitive to the topic and kind, and so I can imagine you're, <laughs> yeah. You're, are there any student stories that, that kind of stand out to you that are not necessarily, I mean, we talked about how work doesn't really, if, you know, have a intersect with your writing, but how did those stories affect you in general? Or is there anything that stands out? Well, I, I, I would have to generalize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Due to privacy many, or? Well, I mean, also there's just too many. Like, how too many? choose? Yeah, you that's know? true. So. You know, I work in South Sac, and CRC 
you know, I guess a few years ago was the tenth most diverse college in the country. So and and I don't remember what the income level of the people um, going there, but you know, um, as as one of my colleagues said, you know, most of our students are brown and poor, mm -hmm. and you they and and they and have again most diverse right one of the most diverse colleges in the country. So I guess my takeaway from my experiences there is just um, the perspective of the amount of strength and resilience and determination and courage mm. of the people that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it really is inspiring. So when I get whiny about my own life, which is frequently, <laughs> We're entitled to do that, Lisa. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, you, you look at the people that have, have worked so hard to sit in that room. Uh, and it's like, you know, I mean, what do I have to say? With all my privileges, you know, I mean, I'm privileged to be in that room with them. I mean, really, that's what my biggest takeaway is mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for my job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a, well, I think that I am so glad that you are at CRC, having, you know, met you at Valley High School, which is right across the street. Um, and I think that the, the professors that teach with you, I'm aware of who they are, and they are very strong in their own right. Yeah. So I think you, you've created a, such a great alliance of people. Oh, yeah, no, that's not me. That's, I mean, I, that's not like, oh, yeah, I pulled this whole team to get Right, right, yeah, right. No, this is just, I mean, this happened, I've been fortunate enough to work with the majority of the people that I work with. Mm -hmm. The majority of the people that I work with that are in the decision-making positions, especially, I would say, right now, um, are, are try to make choices that are going to benefit the students mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, faculty, staff, everything else like that. I think that is more and more true. Um, as as things shift, I, I really feel like, you know, yeah. that's that's true. I just get to work there. Yeah. It looks very different. My yeah. colleagues are, uh, it's a very different mix than mm. it was when I started mm. in 94. Extremely mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's cool. It's, yeah. It's different in a good way. I'm, you know. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, let's shift back to the poetry. Okay. And, um, are there any poems that you want to share that yours or others that you would like to read at this point? That, um, that kind of... Oh, or others? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Let's see. I brought too many poems of others. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I'll read one from the book that we're going to be talking about today with my group. Oh. How about that? That is wonderful. Which we get is, to be in on it now. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I chose a backup one, so I'm still good for my group. Okay. So this is uh, Ilya Kaminsky's Deaf Republic, hmm. which I thought was remarkable. And I'll read the last poem in the book which is in a time of peace. Inhabitant of earth for 40 something years, I once found myself in a peaceful country. I watched neighbors open their phones to watch a cop demanding a man's driver's license. When the man reaches for his wallet, the cop shoots. Into the car window, shoots. It is a peaceful country. We pocket our phones and go to the dentist to pick up the kids from school, to buy shampoo and basil. Ours is a country in which a boy shot by police lives on the pavement for hours. We see in his open mouth the nakedness of the whole nation. We watch, watch others watch. The body of a boy lives on pavement exactly like the body of a boy. It is a peaceful country, and it clips our citizens' bodies effortlessly, the way the president's wife trims her toenails. 
all of us still have the hard work sorry, all of us still have to do the hard work of dentist appointments, of remembering to make a summer salad, basil, tomatoes. It is a joy, tomatoes, add a little salt. It is a time of peace. I do not hear gunshots, but watch birds splash over the backyards of the suburbs. How bright is the sky as the avenue spins on its axis. How bright is the sky, forgive me, how bright. It's a powerful poem, very powerful. I can see why you selected, why did you select that one? <sighs> because it speaks to today, mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. and I think that it speaks to, um, well, I like the way that it looks on the page. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I, I changed directions there. But I, I like, I appreciate the way that it speaks to <laughs> too many recurring events mm -hmm. and the way the majority of us, and I'll put myself in the us, continue to go about our lives. Mm -hmm regardless of who we donate to, regardless of how many letters we click and send, you know, mm -hmm. on the internet for the most part, mm -hmm. speaking for myself, I go about my own life. So to me, this, I'm being called out here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and... I, I do feel called out too when I hear the poem. Uh -huh. yeah. And... Um, and it's done with delicacy, and I think we need... I think all of us benefit from a variety of ways that artists speak to what's going on in contemporary co times. So the art on the wall right now mm -hmm. is one way. The, this is another way. Mm -hmm. I think we need a variety of voices and artists and images being communicated because each piece reaches someone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm or reaches all of us, mm -hmm. you know? Like I said, when I walked into this space, I said, oh, I'm home. Mm -hmm. I can feel so comfy here. Yeah. I feel comfortable inside this poem too, mm -hmm. even being called out. So I like mm -hmm. that. And then in terms of a writer, I'm so, um, I'm so stuck mm -hmm. in the shapes of my own poems. Mm -hmm. And this poem alternates between couplets and triplets and single lines. Mm. And it alternates between long lines and very little short lines. And I like the way that it uses the space on the page, even though it hugs the left margin, which is what I tend to do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I've, got a, I've got an iron grip on my left margin. <laughs> um, so there's just so much I admire about mm. it. And, it and, and really, the poem resonates even more having read the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, I can see that. And you know, People who are listening and who are in the audience may not see the structure, but I can see how it feels. But they can it buy might, the book. You can buy the book, and yes. And see the structure. Yeah. <laughs> it is always liberating to see someone else's structure and follow that pattern and make it your own, I think, yeah. is, is very valuable, too. And that, that idea of kind of mixing a mess, mixing the same message within modalities, like you were referring to Milton Bowen's artwork, which is up on the wall now at the gallery, and then also poetry and other ways of expression. Do we have any responsibilities as artists that go beyond the page, for example? Um, I think you kind of alluded to that in well, a way. I think we have a responsibility as people to go beyond the page as much as we can given our current circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's my, that's, you know, actually, I guess it could be seen as a dodge, but I think everybody does what they can in the moment, whatever you can. I think as artists, though, we have a responsibility to truth mm -hmm. and to our own truths. Mm. And I think that sometimes people can force themselves to address issues and then mm. the message rings strident or rings mm -hmm. false mm -hmm. or misses the mark. And in that case, no, I don't think 
that somebody who isn't really feeling it, where it doesn't feel like it's a necessary thing for them, mm -hmm. but they're just feeling like they need to be PC and, right. and hit this one, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this particular issue, mm -hmm. got to do the babies in cages poll, right. then it's not going to feel real. Mm -hmm. And then I don't think that that, I mean, I, I just think we have to, it's a continual check-in process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've taken some workshops with Joshua McKinney, and one of the things that he said which struck me was, we don't write for anyone else except ourselves. And I don't know if he still believes that, but he'll probably <laughs> let me know. Um, but I think that in a way you're, you're, you're talking about the same thing as what he mentioned, because if we're not speaking our own truth within our art form, then we're not really we're not able to really validate the point as far as it can go. For example, if you're talking about peace and you have, you know, you're referring to examples maybe outside of your radius that are not within your reach, it becomes hard to relate to the art form. I'm not sure if I'm coming across, but generally the truth aspect, I think, has been very valuable for me in my art. and. Mm -hmm. If I'm not telling the truth, then it's a flop. Um, this is a little bit off point, but um, Go for it. There's, a, there's a discussion in the media now about the economics of our nation. And it has, it has revolved around the US-China relationship we have and the tariffs that are being imposed on China over the last year. Um, and then also there has been recently a mention of a possible recession. Now, from my experience as an arts educator, I'm not concerned as much about 401ks as much as how it's going to really hit the arts community again and the education community. Um, I was basically a victim because I was in the primary grades and you know I didn't have a job every summer so that pushed me into another work area which was museum um, but then how, what's your take on how to I'm not asking for a solution but what could. what thoughts come to your mind when that could be a possibility again because they say that recession happens every so often, seven or eight years. And we are, education is very vulnerable. Yeah, I, I can only observe the obvious, um, which is that, I'll go back to privilege. I, mm -hmm. I have a full-time job. Mm -hmm. I have tenure. I have health insurance. Mm -hmm. So probably, as much as anybody in this country, I am the individual who will be least affected by a recession. Mm -hmm. However, the majority of my colleagues, the majority of my colleagues are part-time. Mm -hmm. Their jobs are semester to semester, mm -hmm. even when they have um, preference, you know, a kind of seniority within ad the adjunct community. So I can only say that any recession, anything where um, that affects the economy will affect the majority of educators, certainly in the community college system, mm -hmm. far more radically than it'll affect those of us who you know, are, are, are cushioned sure. from it. Which is, which is so um, you I, know. I, I'm just making an observation. Right, I don't right. have a solution other than the solutions that all of us have been proposing for a bazillion years, mm -hmm. which is to shift the, the proportion of full-time and part-time, hire more full-time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. don't have this inequity, mm -hmm. and I can talk about it a hundred years, but I'm not an administrator, and I'm not in a position of decision-making power. I can just keep voting for it. Right, right, and which is huge, though, it. because you are part of that thank community. thank you to the majority yeah. of my colleagues right. for hanging in there, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, yeah. I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what the solution is there beyond yeah. everything that all our union reps have been, have been working so hard to do for decades. Right. What so, about arts education or more so poetry? Um, well, let's shift back to poetry. 
what do poets, what do you think poets can, what can they do? I mean, they can write poetry, but how, what are some things that you would like to see that have not been done or have been done in the past that would you would like to see come back in the poetry community that not only addresses some of these kinds of challenges, but some of the major issues, like for example, the divide between people because of some of the rhetoric that's out there in politics or um, some of the difficulties like I mean, this is a this is really blowing it wide open. But you know, the shootings that are happening. So all of this, what can we do as poets that you think might be a baby step towards, you know, doing something? Well, I have no original thoughts, so mm -hmm. I'll just say what I know is going on right now. Yeah. So I'm on um, the committee for the Mes de Latinx at mm -hmm. CRC for oh. uh, this. Uh, fall and our theme is testimonios mm. and so with the idea of making people's stories visible helping people's stories become visible and we're so blessed because we're going to have Marcelo Hernandez Castillo as our keynote speaker and yeah and the community is invited mm. and so I think that when I think that there are a lot of people in the country right now who feel invisible, mm -hmm. particularly when, in terms of the uh, you know, presidential response to the mass shootings and mm -hmm. everything else like that. So I think one thing that poets can do, particularly educated, you know, poets who are in education, mm -hmm. is to provide opportunities for those who, for people to tell their stories mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to provide a way for people to feel more comfortable telling their stories. Mm -hmm. So. Some years ago, I had the opportunity, it was, it was just amazing to go to Rwanda mm. with one of my good friends who's Rwandan. And went to the Genocide Museum in Kigali and the way that they set it up was they had pictures and stories and sometimes little objects of some of the people who had been murdered. I mean, there's genocide, you know, uh, uh, testimonials and and museums and, and historical sites all over the country. Mm. But in one of them, the saying by, in one of the rooms was, if you knew me, you would not have killed me. Wow. And I think that that's really true. Mm. I think that the more that each individual can be shown in all of their individuality, mm -hmm. the harder it is to blanket a group of people mm -hmm. with, with, with kind of two or three adjectives, right? right? If you saw the individual, mm -hmm. if you got to know that individual, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you would not have killed that individual. Right, right, right. And or you wouldn't you you would want to reach out and help that person, right? right. right? Or you would or not help them, but you would you would stand by them as an ally. Right. You would link arms with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think that that's something that poet educators could do mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. to help people tell their stories and then maybe find a way to make those stories visible. Right. Particularly in our communities that right now are not being sufficiently addressed, they're not being sufficiently seen in mm. all of their complexities mm. right now. Mm. Well, that's a, a wonderful way of thinking and um, a call to action. How's that? That is your call to action. Um, I'd like us, we're coming to our close, but I would love for you to read a poem. I'm not going to select it for you, so you decide which one you'd like to read. I know you have selections. Okay. Um, um, well, then I'll, man, after I read Kaminsky's poem, <laughs> <laughs> so we're in good company. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I brought this giant stack of books because I thought, you know, you might want, be wanting me to choose. So, so I'll read the last poem in the book since I read the last poem in his book because that's Wonderful. easier for me. Yeah. Um, and because it references two poets mm. whose books I don't have here, they're at home. If I thought okay. about it, I would have brought theirs too. Um, and so, and I've read this at reading, so my apologies for the, <laughs> you guys if you've heard this before. Um, so Roger Reeves, the poet Roger Reeves, has a book called King Me. Mm -hmm. And in King Me, there's a poem called Someday I'll Love Roger Reeves, which he said he had taken from maybe a Philip Larkin poem, and I could easily have that wrong. And then in Ocean Vuong's Night Sky with Exit mm -hmm. Wounds, 
he has a poem, Someday I'll Love Ocean Vuong. Oh. After Roger Reeves. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is my version of that poem. And this is what I'm saying about how poets, you know, how we respond to one another's work. So this is yeah. my response to their poems. Mm. Um, and me trying to talk to myself and tell myself my truth. Um, it does mention the words might sound weird on the podcast. Er, it's capital U R, like original. Okay. Okay. Um, Lepidopterist of closet moths, after Roger Reeves and Ocean Vuong. Someday, I'll love Lisa. Just that much before the name of a father or a husband. I'll lose my expertise in self-denigration, a lepidopterist of closet moths, every mistake pinned and labeled. For decades, I've studied their coppery wings. Lisa, your tweezers and magnifying glass no longer reveal surprise. It's time to close the glass lid on your collection and try something new. Trace circles in a sand tray. Begin the mental walk between granite and obsidian back to the Ur girl. Remember, before you wished yourself bride or mother, before you became this crimped scientist, you were a bony child pedaling uphill past your playground by the cemetery at dusk. Lisa, she is still you, fully yin and yang, the lit spokes of your bicycle spinning. Feel yourself again as you were, though evening deepens and headstones begin to glow Pull up on your handlebars, stand on the pedals, and pump hard for the crest. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me here. You are welcome, and we hope that you come back and visit us for future Coffee and Poets. Yeah. <laughs> um, this concludes number 41, Coffee and Poets at the Brick House Gallery and Art Complex. I'm here with Lisa Dominguez Abram. And you can go to Past Poets uh, Coffee Podcasts at co coffeeandpoets.com or listen to this podcast again at the same website. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Lisa, again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>